not in the Bible. I have been preaching for a long time. And one thing I have learned is that communication is difficult. Whether you preach or not, you already know that that is very true. You can say something that you think is very clear, and you can even be convinced that the other person heard exactly what you meant. But they heard something else. Like the young man who came up to the fellow and said, your daughter is crazy about me. She's always with me, and she says she wants to be with me forever. So the man asked, are you asking me if you can marry my daughter? No, I'm asking you to tell her to leave me alone. <laughs> Communication is, is difficult. About the preacher. It said, after the sermon, we will dismiss and we will have a meeting of the board in the fellowship hall. So after the service is over, the preacher walks into the fellowship hall and there is a first time visitor in the room. So the preacher said, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a meeting of the board only. And the visitor said, after that sermon, I have never been more bored in my life. So the reason that we are having this series called That's Not in the Bible is because in Christian culture, we put together certain cliches, and the reason they exist is because they are built on something that is true. It is true that God wants to help us bear our burdens, even if the Bible does not say that he will never give you more than you can handle. It is true that God works in all things to bring about good, even though the Bible does not say everything happens for a reason. Or for example, I got some, some pushback from some folks when I preached about God having a plan for your life. I don't think the Bible says that in the way that we often mean it. I don't believe God has a blueprint for our life. I believe he has more of a game plan for our life. And inside that game plan, you have many choices. I do believe that God guides our lives. I do believe that God directs our lives. I do believe that God opens up doors for us. Let me illustrate. Dr. Kent Brantley, the well-known medical missionary that contracted and survived the Ebola virus, actually went to a school down in Texas called Abilene Christian University to become a minister. While he was in school, he changed his major from Bible to medicine because he figured that was a way he could serve God. Now, if he had remained a Bible major and been a minister, would he have been disobedient to God? Would he have not been following the plan? Seems to me that both of his options were good ways to serve God. So when we say these things, we're taking something that, that is true, but sometimes we take them too far. And I say all of that because the sermon today has great potential to be misunderstood. Because I know people get very unhappy when you start messing with our culture's obsession with being happy. Because we believe it is our inalienable right to pursue happiness. It is in the very foundation of our nation. In fact, we think the worst thing that you can do to another person is to keep them from doing what they want to make themselves happy. We want all of our stories to end happily ever after. We really do worship as a culture happy, but we also worship God. So it is only expected that we would mix these two obsessions and it would come out something like God wants you to be happy. It is God's job in heaven to be the boss of a big happy factory just cranking out 
can after can of happy for us. Doesn't it sound true that God wants us to be happy? After all, God doesn't want us to be unhappy, does he? But think about it. If God wants me to be happy, then chocolate and blue bunny ice cream would not be fattening. If God wanted me to be happy, cats would be an endangered species. Often, God wants me to be happy says a whole lot more about what I want than about what God wants. But again, does God want us to be unhappy? You sense the tension. So we're going to dive in, and here is the first thing that I want you to understand. Write this down. The Bible does not say that happiness is a problem. Grumpiness is not next to godliness. Glumness is not a good witness. We all know Christians who act like they were baptized in lemon juice. And they do not represent Jesus well. The perception that many people have of Christian people is that we are not particularly delightful people. And yet, we were created in the image of God, which means we were created with an immense capacity to be delighted. That would be because God is the most joyous being in the entire universe. Dallas Willard helped me to see this. He said one time he was in South Africa and a friend had taken him to the beach. Now he had seen lots of beaches, but he had never expected the beauty that he saw that day. He said it was stunning. His words, as I walked toward the water, I felt more and more an almost sense of giddiness come over me. And it dawned on me, this is God. Every moment, God has views like this, billions of views like this, all over, worlds, everywhere. It is God's nature to be full of delight. And because God is a good father, he delights when his children are delighted. And you've walked into a room when your kids were playing and, and they were laughing and they were giggling. And you were overcome with delight because of the happiness of your children. But if you are a good parent, you know that you do not make your goal to do whatever you have to do to keep your kids happy. Because if your goal was to do whatever they wanted to make them happy, you know they would grow up petty, spoiled, immature, self-absorbed adults destined for politics. <laughs> And God is not going to do that. God is not going to wire the world so that you constantly stay happy. God has ordered the world so that times of happiness and times of unhappiness come to all. The preacher says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, when times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Notice, happiness is connected to times. Happy and happen both come from the same English word, hap, which means chance. So if things happen to happen, I'll be happy. But if they happen to happen a different way, I won't be happy. So happiness is circumstantial and it always has a fleeting quality to it. A good example of this is in the book of Jonah, chapter 4 of, of Jonah. It says that Jonah was, was outside of the city of Nineveh. It was very hot. God had a shade tree grow up and give Jonah shade. 
And it says that made Jonah very happy. But then a worm came and it caused the tree to die. And Jonah was very unhappy. And that's how happiness works. If you've got shade, you're happy. If you lose the shade, you're not happy. And God has ordered the world so that rain will fall on the just and on the unjust. And we have times of shade. And we have times when the shade is gone. And you don't have to put on a plastic smiley face if you're a Christian and pretend that you are always happy. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, says in James 5, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Because sometimes you're going through a season of hardship and sometimes you are in a season of happiness. And right now in this room, we have people in both seasons. And God is big enough. And the church should be big enough for people in both places to come together. Because God delights in your happiness. He's thrilled when you are in a, a season or a time of happiness. But God has never claimed that the pursuit of happiness is the highest aim for us as his children. The Bible doesn't have a problem with happiness. But also write this down, the Bible doesn't say that happiness is a promise. The reality is a lot of misery results from the mindset that I am entitled to be happy. Think with me for a moment. If I believe that God wants me to be happy, then I will start to conclude that whatever makes me happy must be right. I know some pretty crazy stuff's going on at that party, but they sure are having fun, and, and I could use a can of happy right now. I know it's wrong to break your marriage vow. But I can't believe this is wrong. I just know God wants me to be happy. And I can't tell you how many times I have heard that kind of statement. You see, where happiness takes us when that is our grid. And if God wants me to be happy, then that would mean that hardship and discomfort and risk can't be God's will for me. Why would I ever sacrifice? Why would I ever get out of my comfort zone? That doesn't make me happy for that matter. Why would I ever pick up a cross? Do you think Jesus thought Calvary was a happy place? You see what happens it's a subtle form of idolatry because this thinking makes God exist to serve me, which inevitably leads to disappointment in God. We have all had conversations with people that said, yeah, I've tried the God thing. I, I tried that church thing. It didn't work for me. And what, what that really means is it didn't make me happy. And isn't it true that most of the great decisions of disobedience in your life you made motivated because you thought happiness was somewhere else? So just like the prodigal son, you went to the far country because you thought that would make you happy. Nobody understands the appeal of happy like the advertising industry. They are constantly telling you what you need to buy so that you can be happy. You can go and, and get a drink when it is happy hour. No one does this more strategically or more brilliantly than McDonald's. Because they know there is a market out there of young parents wondering what they can do to get their three-year-old to stop screaming. So they say, come to McDonald's, and we will put a warmed-up hamburger 
and some warm fries and a cheap toy in a sack and we will sell you a healthy meal? A hungry meal? No, they will sell gazillions of happy meals. And how long does that work? So your three-year-old eats their happy meal and they go into the play place. And 30 minutes later you say, okay honey, it's, it's time to go home. Now normally they would scream and they would fuss, but because they've had a happy meal, they come right along and they say, absolutely mom, I'm so happy. And we laugh, but as we get older, we just buy bigger and more expensive happy meals because everyone is looking for a can of happy. In New York City, there's over 20 million pets. If your dog or cat dies, you just can't go out in the backyard and bury it. So the city offers a service for $50. They will come and they will take the carcass of your pet away. When an enterprising young woman put an ad in the newspaper saying she would come and take care of your deceased pet for $25. And here's what she did. She'd go to Goodwill or the Salvation Army and she would buy an old suitcase for $2. She would go to the apartment, get the carcass of the pet, put it in the suitcase, and then she would get on the subway, set the suitcase down beside her, turn the other way and act distracted, and inevitably, within a few moments, somebody would steal her suitcase. <laughs> and they would get home thinking they had just stole some happy. <laughs> but they were very disappointed. And we all are, because if you set your GPS to happy, you will never stop driving. What if we were really seeking was a different destination than what we imagined? And what if God was not in the way of our highest joy, but he actually was the way? I don't find Jesus telling us to pursue happy. He told us something else, Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Here's the principle that I want you to catch. Write this down. The Bible says the kingdom is a better pursuit. Here's why we are often so un happy. Life refuses to recognize your sovereignty. Or to put it another way, you don't ever get to be king. So if you are needing everything to work out the way that you want and the way that you would order it and the way that you would command for you to get happy, you are never going to get there because you don't ever get to be in control. You are not, you have never been, you never will be sovereign. Happiness is the byproduct of seeking a better way. Jesus said over and over, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Don't seek your reign. Seek his. And when God's rule and God's reign becomes your agenda, and that's what you pursue, here is the reality. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what the stock market does. It doesn't matter what the headlines are. It doesn't matter what the lab report says. Because you can still pursue the reign of God. And what happens then is that you begin to experience a contented spirit, 
and it can't be explained. But it can't be explained away either. Jesus said, there is something that will not make sense about your life to people that don't pursue God's kingdom. Matthew 5, Jesus says, happy are those whose lives are harassed because they are righteous and they have the kingdom of God. <laughs> what? Look at his words, Matthew 5. Blessed, happy are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Richard Wormbrand was a man who founded a ministry called Voice of the Martyrs. This is an organization that keeps a record of the persecuted church around the world. And he would be a good person to found it because he knows firsthand. He was born in Romania with a Jewish faith. He came to Christ as a young adult about the time that his country became controlled by the Communist Party. Before he was finally exiled to America, he spent many years in prison. And he wrote about it in a book called Tortured for Christ. And let me tell you, that is a hard read. Some of the things that he went through were, were chilling. But in that book, he writes this stunning paragraph. It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that Whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. So we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached and they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy beating us. Everyone was happy. Who thinks like that? Not people who think happy is some what. And yet, don't you have the memory in your life when you went through some circumstance and it was not happy and yet you look back and you were transformed by that circumstance? Because in it, you experienced the grace and goodness of God at a depth you had not known before that time. That's why I don't really like how sometimes preachers say, God's not into your happiness. He cares about your holiness. Like it is either or. You can be holy and miserable or happy and ungodly. No. What if pursuing God and His reign and being holy was the path to higher joy? Because when our lives are focused on the reign of Christ, the Spirit of Christ is, is released in us to fill us with something that is better than happiness. Paul said it like this in Romans 14, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. E. Stanley Jones, who's often called the Billy Graham of India, said, I am a happy man because my happiness is not dependent on happenings but upon the joy of belonging to him, whatever happens. Write this down. The Bible says that joy is a better gift. You read the book of Acts, the early Christians went through a lot of things that you would not call happy. And yet they were full of joy. 
Joy is independent of changes and of chances. It doesn't come in a package. It comes in a presence. Because happiness doesn't come from pursuing happiness. It comes from pursuing God. Here is what happy people know. Happy is not a what. And if you spend the rest of your life chasing the next what to make you happy, you will have to chase, after you get that, the what next, the what else. Happy is not a what. Happy is a who. God is not in the way of your highest joy. God is your highest joy. When my grandmother got sick, was in the hospital in Florida, I flew down to be with her. I left her in Wustoff Hospital in Florida. When I went back, she was in a casket. Before I left her, my last evening with her on this earth, she was in her bed in her hospital room. She urged me to come back home. I was figuring out in my head how I could try to delay my flight or change my flight and not come back or just stay there and make it happen to stay longer. But she said I needed to come back to my wife, to my sons. She didn't want me staying any longer and she told me not to worry about her. She grabbed my hand. She said, Michael, you know what happiness is ahead of me. Don't be sad for me. My grandmother knew that happiness was because of who she was going to be with. The Bible doesn't say that God wants you to be happy. The Bible says that God wants you to have something better. And I do too.